This is, Hearable. The Orville New Horizons, Unofficial Domino Companion. Chapter 1. Charlie slammed her shoulder against the dark corridor of the USS Quimby. She tried to push herself upright, but the task was made more difficult with her inebriated friend draped over her shoulder. Amanda's full body weight tipped towards Charlie, pinning her against the wall. For a moment, the two young women were frozen mid-stumble, not quite standing, and not yet a heap on the ground. Their current state afforded Charlie time to contemplate her next move. A mistake at this moment would pull them both to the ground and would subsequently require much effort to get Amanda standing again. Though Amanda was not much taller than Charlie, she had the body density of a star rugby player, which she was, during her academy years. Charlie's sport of choice, soccer, allowed shorter speedsters like herself to excel. She wasn't even fast in an athletic sense. Her ability to visualize for dimensions allowed her to react before anyone else. The two recent academy graduates, with Amanda, only three years Charlie's senior, met at a pickup soccer match in the simulator. Amanda would later tell Charlie that pickup rugby matches just weren't a thing, so she decided to give soccer a try. And she did better than try. Charlie zipped passes to her from every direction, and she would seemingly score on each one. Not until the following day did Charlie realize her soccer buddy was an astrometrics nerd when the two passed each other wearing their union uniforms. Amanda mumbled something under her breath, but was otherwise oblivious to their current predicament. Charlie breathed heavily from exertion. She had carried Amanda from the mess hall through two corridors that stretched halfway across the ship. In the months after they first teamed up, both women had become the best of friends. The two of them were celebrating their most recent victory with their other teammates in the mess hall. While others talked, mingled and sometimes hopped between groups, Amanda and Charlie mostly conversed with each other. When someone did visit, Amanda took the responsibility of table host and engaged the visitor in polite small talk. During these moments, Charlie would simply observe. One time, Amanda seemed to notice forcing Charlie to quickly gaze elsewhere. As the night went on, their teammates departed one by one. Amanda and Charlie were the only ones that remained. Charlie enjoyed their conversations but forgot Amanda couldn't handle her bourbon as well as she could. Finally, with only two hours before her next shift, Charlie carried Amanda back to her quarters. Or at least that was the intent. A tangling of their feet left them precariously propped against the wall of Commander Frost's quarters. Charlie feared that at any moment, he would burst through his door to chastise the two of them for setting a poor example as officers. With both hands, Charlie pushed at Amanda's torso until Amanda began to fall in the opposite direction. She then grabbed Amanda's arm, using the momentum of Amanda tipping the other way to pull herself upright. Luckily for Charlie, Amanda was able to stand and step forward as long as someone maintained her balance and heading. The two of them continued to weave through the dark hallway. Upon reaching the door, Charlie punched in the key Amanda had given her several months ago when they were obviously becoming good friends. Charlie never reciprocated with a key for Amanda to her quarters. She did not know why, but she always had difficulty returning affection. Doing so, especially in a new relationship, made her uncomfortably vulnerable, a sensation she would always forego at all cost. Amanda never seemed to mind. Charlie was grateful. Unlike the cozy feel of Amanda's quarters, Charlie's own quarters were more spartan and less welcoming. This was not unlike the personality she projected to keep all but true friends at a distance. Charlie guided her friend to the bed and gently plopped her down. Amanda let out an audible sigh as she sank into the bed. Charlie considered helping Amanda change out of her soccer kit, something a friend would do. However, in recent weeks things began to change between them. There was something about the confident way she moved, how her hair flowed as she ran down Charlie's passes, and the sparkle in her eyes as she talked about astrometrics that was changing how Charlie thought of Amanda. Uncertain of how she or Amanda would react, Charlie decided to leave well enough alone. She removed Amanda's shoes and pulled the synthetic blanket over her before heading for the door. The door hissed open as Charlie approached. She was about to step through when Amanda spoke in a slightly slurred voice. I love you, she said before snuggling into her pillow. 
Charlie froze, uncertain of how to respond. These sacred words require build-up and context. What did they mean after an evening of getting hammered? Amanda had a tendency for odd phrasing even when sober and Charlie had a tendency to overanalyze even when drunk, which she was, quite drunk, at that moment. Amanda was clearly drunk and would not likely remember even if Charlie reciprocated. Yet even now, when the risk was so low, Charlie hesitated. Every part of her wanted to dash to her quarters. Instead, she took a shallow breath, turned back towards Amanda. When she tried to respond her words barely trickled out. I love. The room disintegrated in front of Charlie's eyes, replaced by the blackness of space punctuated by the soft red glow of a single k sphere. Amanda, who was moments prior lying peacefully in bed, was violently sent tumbling into the vacuum. Charlie screamed as the USS Quimby's klaxon blared around her. Her hands pounded on the doorway to the non-existent room, causing the structural integrity force field to shimmer. The sphere's red glow grew more intense as it prepared to fire. Charlie's hatred was equally intense. If she could only reach the sphere, she would rip it apart with her bare hands, gravity and lack of oxygen be damned. The sphere fired, bathing everything in red, and then everything went black. Ensign, said a mechanical voice. She reached out into the darkness and grabbed at the voice. Her hands gripped tightly on the neck of a kalon. The muscles on her back tensed as she prepared to snap its neck when the creature suddenly stood up straight, pulling her from a sitting to a standing position. Ensign Burke, Isaac said, pausing for a moment as if uncertain of the right words. You should get some rest. Humans are most inefficient when they fail to complete a regeneration cycle. Charlie glared at the Kalon, her eyes filled with hatred. In contrast, Isaac's blue eyes, never blinked, never wavered, never reflected his state other than his capacity to keep the light lit. Why were they even blue when other Kalons had red eyes? At times she felt manipulated by how Isaac looked and acted. I shall continue our work, Isaac said, his tone soothing, his hands accentuating the artificial intonation of his words. Charlie loosened her grip on Isaac's neck, planted herself firmly on the ground before letting go. The release intention cleared her thoughts and helped reduce her disorientation. She was on the USS Orville and had been for nearly a year. The USS Quimby was destroyed when the Kalons launched a surprise attack on Earth, the same attack in which Amanda was forced to launch their escape pod manually in order to save Charlie. The first month was awful as Charlie was plagued by recurring nightmares. How many times have the Kalon killed Amanda now? At least ten. Shortly after, the survivors of that battle were reassigned to the remaining Union ships with perhaps a good third of the Orville crew now pulled from the ranks of other destroyed ships. This group, Charlie included, harbored deeply negative sentiments towards Isaac. Charlie only recently began to accept that Isaac was different from other Kalons. And through the project the two of them were working on, this Kalon may save the Union. There's no time to rest now, Charlie said as she positioned herself next to Isaac at the engineering console. If they are successful, there will be no more new Amandas, no more new Charlie Burks, and perhaps most importantly, there will be no more Kalons. The rights to the Orville and the Orville New Horizons belong to 20th Century Studios. Hearable Audio thanks you for listening.